Hello and welcome to Hive 2023. I'm Bradley and I'm the moderator of the Synopsis Stock Talk to Ryzen panel. I'm here with four amazing panel panelists, Kana Van Vels Osbury, Lauren Davila, this, uh, Hannah Cates, and E.M. Anderson. Hi, everyone. So first of all, I will uh, give uh, each panelist a moment to introduce themselves, starting with E.M. Hi, I am E.M. Anderson. Um, my debut novel, The Remarkable Retirement of Edna Fisher, um, is out with Hanson House Books. It's about an 83-year-old who leaves the nursing home for a fantastical adventure. It has dragons. It has found family. Um, it has far too many plants, considering that it's mostly about dragons and found family. Um, and so, yeah, it's my debut novel. I'm really excited about it. Um, and when I'm not writing, you can find me off in the forest trying to become one with the trees. Thank you. Hanadi? Hi, everybody. My name is Hannah Van Vels Osbury. I'm a senior literary agent at the Balcastro Agency, where I work in a variety of genres. Um, I wrap a lot of picture books, middle grade, young adult, as well as select adult genres. Um, and I'm so excited to chat with you guys about synopses tonight. Thank you. Lauren? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Lauren Davila, and I am an author, anthologist, and acquisitions editor for a small press. I have a few anthologies, I think at this point about five. Um, my latest one, Other Side, is right here. Um, Places We Build in the Universe, which is an adult anthology of speculative work um, focused specifically from Latinx authors. Um, and beyond that, I am the acquisitions editor for Inked and Gray Press. Um, we are focused on really highlighting marginalized voices in a lot of um, genre spaces. Thank you. Hannah Cates? Hello, everybody. I'm Hannah Cates. I am a fic agented fiction author. I'm a resident editor here at Right Hive. I am an editor editor, and additionally, I'm a best-selling ghostwriter. So I'm very happy to be here, very happy to be back. Brad, thank you so much for moderating. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so let's start with the first question. What's a synopsis compared to a summary or a book blurb? Starting with Hanavi. I approach synopsis from an agent perspective, um, from the publishing side. Um, so the way that we use a synopsis is to figure out where a story is going to go. Um, so a synopsis is most often 500 words to 1,000 words, um, usually somewhere in that word count. And it goes through and gives the major beats of your story at a very high level. Um, it gives away the ending. It gives us the spoilers. But it's not giving us every single detail of your book. A good analogy that I like to think of is that while a book blurb might try to sell your book, a synopsis is you telling me about your book. Yeah. Um, so basically the same thing that Hannah said, where the synopsis is essentially you telling your whole book, the major parts of it, not every detail, but all the major plot points, um, the big twists and spoiling the ending. Um, whereas a book blurb is much more like a teaser for your book. You can kind of think of it like a movie trailer where you're not going to find out everything that's in the book or everything that happens, but it's going to give you enough interest that you want to pick it up and read it. Thank you. Hannah Cates? This is a great question, and I get it all the time, not only on the fiction side, but also on the nonfiction. So when I go through an entry and I'm looking at a synopsis versus a summary, it's, um, and I think uh, um, Hannah V talked about this too, the idea of um, laying it all out and getting, giving a sense of story versus having a hooking blurb that some, is catching somebody's eye on Amazon or is catching their eye in a bookstore and understanding that there are different things used for different purposes. So when I see a blurb, it is, my mind immediately goes, 
marketing. I've got 12 seconds to get somebody's attention. So what is hooking me? What's making me want to read more? What kind of questions uh, is this summary bringing out of me that makes me want to explore more of the text? Whereas with the synopsis, what I'm really looking for is, um, is an understanding of storycraft where we're going, what kind of tensions are in place that the author understands both character and plot arc. Um, again, I know that uh, Ian and Hannah V have both said like really zooming out at that 30,000 foot level to see that there's complete arcs that are working in a complete way. Thank you. And Loan. Wow, I feel like everybody's, everybody's honed in on it. Um, I think it is really scope, and I feel like that that's what it really boils down to, right? As, as Hannah Kate said, the, the blurb is the snappy, quick, you're seeing it flash across your screen on TikTok or Instagram, and you're getting just sort of the broad, quick views, right? The tropes or the genre or um, anything else that would just really hook you in. I think hook's the right, the perfect word to use there. Um, and synopsis is almost a boiled down outline, right? You want to know what's happening making sure that you just have the, the story beats, making sure that you have complete character arcs. So um, I'd say they're really like different beasts. They, I don't even think they're really comparable because they're just so different. Um, and I'm trying to think summary, I know that we have summary in there as well. And I feel like that's sort of in, in, in between, I, I would say between a book blurb and a, and a synopsis. I think summary and synopsis are a little bit closer together, <laughs> maybe. Um, I would say the summary, I think, still hides a little bit, right? You want to keep whoever's reading the summary a little bit on, on the edge, keep them on their toes. The synopsis, you know, you're normally really sharing it with either your editorial team or your fellow writers or something else. So that it'll have all the nitty gritty. It'll have the ending. It'll have all the spoilers that you wouldn't normally include in, in your book blurb or, or your summary um, by chance. Okay, next question. What is the purpose of of writing a synopsis. Yem? Um, so I approach this as a writer. Um, so first of all, there's kind of the way that I think most of us think of synopses as something that like agents and editors want us to do um, to tell them the whole story in detail before they actually read it or find time to read it, um, which is very difficult. But um, you can also use it, or the way I like to use it, um, I like before I draft or sometimes before I revise, I will write a synopsis that is usually longer than what I would send to an agent or editor. Um, so when I was querying, my synopses were one page um, or around 500 words. And when I am writing a synopsis before I draft or revise, they might be three to four pages because it's me figuring out the whole story for myself before I spend all this time writing 100,000 words. Um, so it can help me find plot holes and places where I kind of need to do some research or shore up my character arcs and things like that. Thank you. Loren? It's kind of, um, I know, as I said in the, in the first question, um, really outlining. And I think a lot of it is almost looking at it. I, I like to liken it to sort of your story Bible is what I, is what I kind of call it, right? It's something you can easily refer back to and, and sort of be able to easily track and make sure that, you know, right, your settings are in the right places. You have your pretty complete character arcs that you can, you can see throughout. Um, and in terms of, of plot, which is really, really important, right? You want to make sure that when you're looking at your synopsis, the first quarter of the book doesn't take up a page and a half of your two-page um, synopsis. That might cue you in a little bit there with maybe there's something that we can adjust with pacing if that's sort of how it's looking. Thank you. Hanavi? I love hearing everybody's different approaches and different perspectives when it comes to a synopsis because it really shows you what a versatile tool it can be. Um, when I, How I utilize a synopsis um, is similar to, to some of these other ones where it gives me the high level of what the story is about. It lets me see the major beats um, without having to actually read the story. Um, it's also a great way for some of my clients to kind of communicate to me where their work in progress, something that they haven't written yet, uh, where they think it's going to go. So certain genres do follow certain expectations. So for example, romance needs a happily ever after or happily for now at the end. Um, so if my client um, or someone who's querying me is pitching me a romance, uh, but it ends 
very tragically, uh, it makes me question if we're fitting into those genre expectations. How I use a synopsis when I'm pitching my clients to publishers uh, is many of my clients write these beautiful, wide, sleeping fantasies that have those higher word counts. And it's simply unrealistic to expect everybody on a publishing team to read a book before it's brought to acquisitions, particularly when we're over 100,000 words for a manuscript. Um, so oftentimes for those, I will send along a synopsis. Uh, so instead of reading that 100,000 word masterpiece, uh, Age, or, uh, publishers and, and those on the publishing team can just look at that 500 word synopsis and get a general feel of where the story goes. Um, so in the, on the business side of things, on the publisher side of things, a synopsis is a great way to save time, um, to, to check for story beats and make sure that you're adhering to specific genre conventions. And Hannah Kate. Okay, Lauren used the phrase, the story Bible, and I'm totally going to steal that unabashedly because it's absolutely brilliant. I say when you write a synopsis, and I know I'm going to come off as the bad guy, and in the plotter versus pantser debate, I'm totally going to be the bad guy. I'm the evil empire who's all for plotting. You should, everybody views their synopsis as a chore. You should view it as a joy. You should write your synopsis and here's here's why I think that. Um, everybody's so afraid of it. It's so intimidating to take your gorgeous baby, 120,000 words, and break it down into anywhere between 500 and 1,000. That's awful. It's daunting. But also, when you go on a long road trip, right, and my, my pantsers are going to hate this, you're going on a road trip from New York to LA, you're going to want a road map you're gonna wanna know around the time, hey, I have enough gas, buy my first tank, I should be hitting this city. And by my second leg, maybe I wanna be around here. That doesn't mean that you are locking yourself into like a, um, a uh, something that can't bend or that can't change or that you can't take a detour. But the purpose for me really of writing a synopsis and before, I mean, I've written, I'm working on my 18th book right now. I never start a book nowadays without a synopsis because it is my roadmap. It is telling me, hey, even if I start out and I go a completely different way, at least I've got my North Star, at least I've got a direction. And people ask like, oh, you know, when is my story ready or do I have enough? you know when you're able to take that story circle from beginning to end. The st I would say the purpose of your synopsis is to, is to challenge you to have that story arc, to plan out your roadmap, to be a little selfish about it and say, hey, you know, before I take off, I'm maybe going to know where I'm going. Thank you all. Uh, next question. What does the general process looks like for writing a synopsis and how long does it need to be? Um, Ian, you start to talk about it. Can, can you elaborate more? So again, it how long it needs to be kind of depends on why you're writing it. So if you're using it as more of a planning tool just for yourself, um, like be free, do however many pages you need to do really. Um, my is usually like three to five pages, um, depending on where in the process I am. If you are sending your synopsis to agents, it should really be one page, like two pages maximum. And most agents are gonna say one page from what I have seen. Um, I found a really good post on writing synopses a while ago. It was linked from Janet Reed's blog somewhere. So you can find it by Googling like how to write a novel synopsis and then click on her blog and then scroll to the bottom and find the link where she's like, this is the best post I've ever seen on writing synopses. Um, it's very long. But basically it breaks down the story into like kind of categories like theme, character, plot, things like that. And then under each category, um, it has questions about things having to do with that category. And so I take a stack of note cards and I answer each of those questions for my book. And then I shuffle them together into a way that kind of makes sense to me. And then I use that as sort of an outline and I follow that, the, my stack of note cards. Um, and each one is kind of like a sentence or two of the synopsis. 
Um, so that usually does give me a slightly longer synopsis than I would want to send to an agent or editor. It's usually like two to three pages. Um, and then from there, I look for anything that is not strictly necessary. Like you're really, you're really trying to boil the story down to its most basic parts and the most important things that happen in the plot and character arc. Um, so I usually find after doing my whole note card thing that I can still cut things down, but that just gives me a really, really good start, which I feel like is um, kind of the hardest part is just figuring out where to start and what to even begin to include. Thank you. Uh, Hanadi? I found it's very helpful for writers to first overwrite their synopsis. So whether the synopsis is um, or the original synopsis that they're writing is them trying to figure out their story, them trying to figure out what their character arcs are, where the story is going. Um, I think that's a really good way to start and then pare it down from there to really boil your story down. Um, so what some of the, the writers are saying, like, like EM, um, what is the story at its core? Um, and where can you simplify? I think a lot of writers tend to get a little overwhelmed because they, they see the synopsis and they see um, how com complex the stories that they've written are, and they want to include those subplots. They want to include um, this important secondary character. But most often a synopsis, you're maybe mentioning three to four characters total in that 500 word uh, document. Um, so those are the characters that you're mentioning by name. It's usually your protagonist, your antagonist, maybe a love interest. Um, and the other characters that you that you do need to mention, you can mention them by their role. Um, so instead of calling them out by name, you might say, uh, and then the kings, the evil kings, this manservant um, is doing this rather than calling them out by name, which helps to streamline the process. Um, I think that there are a lot of different places too where you can start writing your synopsis where some writers like to have that synopsis up front before they even start writing. Um, if you're one who writes first, uh, you're maybe more of a pantser than a plotter, um, then it can be helpful to evaluate your work with a reverse outline. Um, even if you just are reading through while you're you're revising your, your work, um, writing down a sentence for each chapter, a sentence summary for each chapter and kind of stitching them together, that can also be a great way to go about making your synopsis. Um, so if you have this, this behemoth of a, of a synopsis, if it's running too long and you're struggling, um, it can also be helpful then to give it over to a critique partner, um, someone who has read your work and who help, can help you kind of streamline your story even more, um, someone uh, who, who can um, help you focus, help you kind of kill some of those darlings that you really want to mention in the synopsis. Um, so when you're also thinking of a synopsis for publication purposes, it's also helpful to keep in mind that it's just one part of your submission package. Uh, the agent or the publisher is going to be seeing your pages too. So a lot of those details you can just save right for the pages. Hannah Cates? This is an excruciating, this is an excruciating question for me because it's an excruciating pro uh, process. Um, when I go to like make <laughs> dinner, I empty out the whole fridge. I say like, and this is a tried and true way. I've worked with a lot of authors uh, developmentally this way, like go through and just give me the laundry list. List every single thing that happens. This happens, then that happens, and this happens, then that happens. Once you've got everything on the table, that's the time, the time to look at it, knowing, hey, you know, I've got anywhere from five, 500 to 1,000 words is usually what um, my agent requires. Um, I know some people who will accept two pages. Normally, we want to be looking around a single page uh, times, times 12 New Roman, of course. Uh, for all you people who like to use fun fonts, please stop. <laughs> Um, have everything out. And when you see what you've got, when you see all of the ingredients that you're cooking with, you can go and try to make sense of them, to see where those beats start falling, to see where the character arc starts to shine, to see where the, the natural organic uh, turns, twists and turns of your plot arc start shaping. So I say start big, just put everything down there. Don't be worried about cutting or trimming or axing your darlings and zoom in as you refine and as you write. Okay, um, Lauren? Yeah, so I can, I can talk a little bit more to the, to the length 
Um, and I can just sort of speak to this as somebody who reads a lot of synopses, you know, every week as, as I have queries that are coming in for, for the uh, publisher that I work for. Um, I always say like the sweet spot is between like a page and a half to max two pages. Like anything, anything beyond that, you gotta, you gotta cut it down just a little bit. I think Hannah Keats is the one who said like a 500 to a thousand words, you know, whether you're doing word count or page count, it's probably going to hover around the same. Um, but if it's a lot smaller than that or a lot longer than that, I would just try to think about it a little bit more wiggle room. Um, and in terms of the general process, this is something that I do myself for my, my novels um, and that I've worked with some of the authors that I've uh, acquired their works for. I always say to do about a two to three sentence summary per chapter. Like as you're writing, like what is this? What's happening in this chapter? Like you just know what's going on. You know you don't need to include it in your actual draft, but just something on a side. I'm kind of like Hannah Cates. You know, I have all all of my different pieces all over the place. I have the 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 doc here and this note over here. So it's a nice little thing to collate, and then you can sort of write. Just look at it chronologically, and you'll be able to tell. Oh, I love this chapter. It has absolutely nothing to do with plot, so I don't have to put something in here about this super intense character centric delving memory filled chapter right it maybe isn't as important it's important to the novel I'm not saying it's not but maybe not as important to the synopsis so um that is something that I think is important especially if you are a plotter it's it's helped me in the past and so then when you get to the synopsis and you're like I can't remember what happened in chapter 14 let me see and you already sort of have that quick little guide and it's a little bit easier to compile it all together so that's my little my little tip there, and that's what I tend to do and what I've helped some of my authors do as well. Thank you. Next question. Um, are there specific uh, guidelines to write a uh, synopsis? Have I case? Just, I want to steal, Laura, I just want to steal all of your ideas, like three sentences per chapter. I'm sitting here taking notes, like that's, that's brilliant. And I'm stealing it immediately. Um, guidelines. Uh, um, Everybody has a process and my authors hate me when I say this. I'm like, just do it right. Just do it right. And it's fine. That's that's not helpful. And that's not what I should say. But really, I, I respect that everybody has their processes. A lot of times when authors come to me, it's because they've hit a wall. So when we're talking about uh, guidelines or where to start or how um, any good editor should be working with you, not telling you what to do. That's my caveat. Um, but something that I like to do with my authors, uh, as far as the guideline and what I'm really looking for, is I want to see a character arc and I want to see a plot arc. Are they the same thing? No. Are they in interdependent? Absolutely. So nothing happens in a vacuum. As your character is growing or developing, or maybe like a confederacy of uh, dunces with Ignatius, they're flat and they're stupid and they're comical or they're just, um, they don't have to be stupid to be flat, but you know what I mean? That they, They're not growing and changing, but they are still, their attitude, their growth, their changes, that's impacting the physical world around them and vice versa, the physical world around them, what's outside, the side characters, uh, what's going on to the plot should be changing their internal arc. So I know what I, uh, one of an author's synopsis is catching on when I can look and I can see both the character arc and the plot arc playing off of each other interdependently and see both of those arcs work together to shape the overall story. Thank you. Lauren? I'm trying to think if there's, I feel like everybody sort of covered the, the nitty gritty. I feel like I can maybe I'm trying to think of something that that I can bring in terms of of my acquisitions role, but I I mean I see a lot of synopses, and I feel like maybe one of the things is heavy tone work in the synopsis. Um, I know that a lot of the time some advice is you know make make your query as sort of like quippy fun as you possibly can, which I feel like that's a whole other conversation for a whole other day. Um, but some of the time I have noticed that, that is what tends to happen for the synopsis. Well, there's lots of asides, there's lots of, you know, parentheticals, there's lots of context being given within the synopsis. Um, and, you know, maybe this is, this is a, a, a going to be an unpopular opinion, but I think I would, I would recommend staying away from some of those. Um, I think some of the time it bogs down at what Han Kate's was saying, right? We want to see the character arcs, we want to see the plot arcs. And some of the time, some of that 
really heavy tone work, which is coming across for you as personality. And we want to know you as the author, right? We definitely do. But um, you have a lot of other things to communicate in the synopsis. And then there's other spaces to communicate some of that in your other package materials for querying or or going out on sub. And so that's that's one thing that I can think of with guidelines for a synopsis. I, I would tone it down the tone. But yeah, I'm gonna go with that. <laughs> Thank you. Hanavi? Again, this is, you wanna keep it high level um, when you're writing your synopsis. I think most often they're in present tense, uh, but I wouldn't say that that's something that's going to make or break um, a case uh, or anything like that. Keep it high level, keep it focused on three to four main characters. Um, if you can, try to get some voice in there, uh, but that's not something that is expected. Uh, most synopses are pretty dry. Most of them are, this happened, which caused this to happen, which caused this to happen. So understand that the purpose of a synopsis is for you to communicate the plot beats. It's not, that's purpose is not to be this beautiful work of art. So take some of the pressure off yourself by just acknowledging that a synopsis is not going to be the most exciting piece of writing uh, that you'll ever do. Um, it's there to just basically spoil, spoil the ending. Thank you. Ian? Um, so going back to, to echo what Hannah said, um, like, just don't worry about the voice like much at all. Um, like she said, you can, you can let it be a little voicey. That's great. If you can manage it. Um, for me, it's usually like the very opening of my synopsis has the most voice and then the rest of it just has like none. Um, but it really is, it's just there to tell the story in basically the most straightforward manner possible. And I think part of the reason that so many writers freak out about synopses is because you're used to having the space to be really voicey. Um, and to be really interesting and to like hide things and slowly unfold them and all of these things. And that is just not what a synopsis is. Um, and it's like, you can just get comfortable, like let the fact that it's supposed to be dry, just take the pressure off. Like you don't have to worry if the writing is not beautiful on a technical level because no one expects it to be. So just let that, like just embrace that, let that take the pressure off um, is kind of my number one um, tip for that. And then the other thing is just to, um, again, echo what people have said previously, like, don't, like you're not going to include details. There isn't room um, unless it is super important to the plot, just leave it out. It is in the book and people will see it later and just don't include it in the synopsis or your synopsis is going to be really long and you're gonna panic. Okay, next question. Uh, what characters should be named or included with a within a synopsis? Um, Hanavi, you start to talk about it. Can you elaborate more? Yeah, sure. Um, so again, I've said this, I think, in, in every answer. Synopsis, high level, very high level. We're not including every single character. We're probably including three or four. Uh, even if you have that wide sweeping 120,000 word fantasy, you're going to focus it on your main character, your protagonist. Um, if you have dual POV, that might be another reason to have um, the second protagonist uh, names. Your antagonist is probably going to be named. Um, and then we might also mention a love interest or an important sidekick. Um, so even though you might have strong secondary characters who have arcs of their own, um, that's not who the synopsis is for. The synopsis is for your main character, um, their arc. Um, so when you do call out them by name, um, they should be an important character, uh, like the protagonist, antagonist. Otherwise, it can be helpful instead to refer to them by the role they play in the, in the story. Um, so uh, the alien, more generically, the naming the particular alien, the waiter, rather as opposed to calling out the waiter, by name um, and keep it just as simple as you can. Okay, yeah. Um, so, so big three, referring back to this article I mentioned before that really helped me um, with my synopsis game. Um, so what this article said and how I like to think of it when you're trying to decide on, okay, aside from my protagonist and antagonist, who do I name in the story? Unless you have like multi POV and you have like five protagonists to choose from. Um, the third one, this article called the impact character. So um, if you take a look at like which secondary character has the greatest impact on the plot and or your main character's arc, 
that is a good person to name. So um, if you have like a very central romance or romantic subplot, strong romantic subplot in your novel, then it's probably the love interest. Um, but it can also be found family, a friend, a parent, um, just literally anyone who's really important um, to the main character and their arc changes their worldview or makes them think differently about things, um, just changes them, impacts them in some way. So think about who your impact character is um, and make that the third or of however many characters you're naming, third or fourth. Lauren. Yeah, so I... I feel like there's not really there's not really a number. I know some people say like no more than three, no more than four. I I don't think you can really. It's going to differ for every every you know book, every novel. Like you know, I'm trying to think of of the you know one of the things that I'm thinking of is like uh, Leah Bardugo's Six of Crows. Like I'm sure her synopsis was filled with characters. Right, there's a huge crew of of people, and in in that case, right, those are all very important. But um. I would say just try to concentrate on really establishing right who your main protagonists and who the main antagonists are doesn't need to be as clear cut um but I think establishing some of those even if it's a semi-important background character you know if they're not really appearing in more than you know like three or four scenes even as important as they are maybe they don't need to necessarily be be named um but I think it really goes back to looking at those very established character arcs right if it's something that's super important to those character arcs that's somebody that you would want to have included in there. Um, but yeah, I know that that's not, <laughs> not a very clear cut answer, but I think it's really, it depends on novel to novel and, and query to query. And Hannah Kids. Gosh, I think everybody's pretty much covered it. This is such great advice. Like we don't need to know his name is Jeeves. We can say the butler or it, there is no, I love what you said, Lauren, there is no hard and fast rule. Um, seen it done so many different ways. Just again, like that horrible answer, just do it right, which is more of a non-answer. Uh, the challenge I want to give, um, and I posit this question all the time, if I take a character out of your synopsis, does it change it? Does the story no longer make sense? Is there a hole in the plot? Uh, does this character somehow come back in a way and now we don't have any context for who they are? And this with cutting um, in anything, whether it be your novel or your synopsis or your query, um, if I say the butler and not Jeeves, or if I just take the butler out completely, does the story still make sense? Does your synopsis still make sense? Okay, well then you probably really didn't need it that much in the first place. And that's hard and it's cruel, Machiavellian. But again, you've only got so much real estate, 500 to 1,000 words, two pages at the very most. Uh, you kind of have to be heartless. So next question. What plot points are necessary, are necessary within a synopsis and what does it need to be included? Um, Hannah Cates? Oh, this is a great question. And I know EM and Hannah V have already touched on this, but let's talk about beats. Whether you love them or you hate them, you can make them uh, work in your favor. So when we talk about which certain beats, I'm not saying that you have to go through and have like a hard and fast checklist, but however you want to break it down whether it's Joseph Campbell's classic hero's journey, whether it's uh, Dan Harmon's story circle, whether it's Save the Cat, which I absolutely love. Uh, there are so many different ways that you can keep, that you can hit these beats or see these beats as portrayed. Um, of course, I, I know that uh, Hannah V mentioned, you know, seeing the character in their zone of comfort, uh, but I want to see um, that act Act one, knowing our character, who they are, what their strengths and weaknesses are, identifying with, hey, this is what's really cool about them. And I'm going to see that they're going to need to lean into it versus, oh, gosh, this is kind of like a toxic trait or something's going to need to change here uh, to that act two where uh, the, the fun and game stage, they're meeting allies, they're changing, they're learning. And you can see, ah, ah the things that they're learning are going to come into play later to solve that big problem. Huge culmination in act three, right? The hero is going to have to let go 
of that negative trait or that limiting belief that's holding them back. They're going to have to lean into that positive, what really makes them special and draws them out as a hero. And they're gonna have to use what they learned along the way in a big culmination to finally defeat the big bad or succeed whatever they're trying to do. So however you wanna break that down, whatever style works for you, this is just how organically um, how stories come together. Uh, so seeing those three acts, uh, seeing those three stages, uh, hitting those individual beats is more, I think, of like a personal, you can choose how you want to do it. But as long as I see that journey and that culmination back to um, that original zone of comfort, I really know somebody knows what they're doing when they manage to do that. Yeah. So I'm going to focus on what doesn't need to be included because that's easier for me. Um, so one thing, this is like weirdly specific, but one issue that I always have both in my synopses and in the actual manuscript is I really like to tell you about like how characters did things and how they got places. I'm like, okay, first they went here to get this vehicle so they could go to this other place. And like in a synopsis, you can just skip all of that. You can be like, okay, characters went to this other place for plot reasons. Um, so like really, it's very hard for me because I'm neurodivergent and I just have a chronic fear of being misunderstood. So I want to over explain, but a synopsis is just not the time to do that. Um, so skip out on any traveling uh, unless your characters like something super plot important happens there. Um, you can skip like, side quests if you want to think of them that way. Um, you can skip subplots unless they intersect with the main plot in a really important way or the character arc in a really important way. Um, honestly, if you use beat sheets, you can probably use your beat sheet as a guide. I don't use beat sheets, so don't quote me. Um, but so for, for what to include, I would say um, follow your beat sheet if you use them. But things to not include, just again, detail. Like I'm such a broken record about that, but just like don't include details. <laughs> Um, Lauren. Uh, so I think it sort of boils down to transition scenes. Right? Those are the scenes that like, we're getting on a bus from point A to point B and these point A and point B is super important to the plot, but do we need to include the conversations that happen on the bus or in the car or on the plane or wherever else you're talking about? And a lot of the time it's sort of getting from point A to point B. Um, and I think that those are some easy scenes that maybe don't need to be included, right? They're definitely important, but some of the scenes that maybe are transition focused may not need to be included in the synopsis, um, whether that is transitioning for the plot or transitioning in terms of character headspace or thoughts or growth. Um, some of those more either internal passages, right? Where well, I know, but that's a whole conversation whether we're having a novel that's very internalized or not. Um, but those are just a few, a few spots that maybe we can parse down for for a synopsis. Um, you know, I think we've we've all sort of honed in on on character arcs and plot arcs, but um, those sort of transitionary spaces are maybe some spots to to cut. If if there's nothing else you can find, maybe look for some of those. And Hanavi. I love that beat sheets were brought up because they're one of my favorite tools to yell at writers about. Um, I think that they can be really helpful, again, in just seeing high level what your story is. Um, so I, I think that when it comes to what to include in the synopsis, um, you want to maybe spend a sentence talking about your main character's status quo to show what they're coming back to. Um, only a sentence or two on, on that, don't want to belabor it. Um, you want to make sure that you include the inciting incident. Um, I am a big fan of the Save the Cat structure uh, and in the different beats laid out there. Um, but if you're not, uh, that's fine. If you're if you're not, if you're not a, a plotter, totally fine. Don't need your beat sheet. Um, so basically, you want to you want to do your character status quo first. Uh, then you want to show what happens to your character the, to the point that uh, they can't turn back, that they can't go back to that status quo. What thrusts them forward? Um, so sometimes this is also called um, the first plot point. Uh, it's really your character's point of no return. Um, plot happens. Characters make choices. Um, we get to the midpoint, which is which is usually worth um, including in the synopsis. 
Um, you also want to include um, uh, show uh, how your character is um, going to get to the climax of the story. You want to show where it's like winning seems imminent, but dun dun dun, here is this bad thing that's about to happen. Um, and then you want to show your resolution. So very, very high level beat sheet can be super helpful. Um, you know, like it's been said, save the save the side quests, save the subplots um, for the pages themselves. Okay, next question. We touched a little about this, but how do you incorporate um, character arcs into a synopsis? Um, starting with Hanavi. So I am a big fan of showing your character's emotional wound. Um, so if you start off with the status quo, um, you know, this character um, has abandonment issues where we're showing that that's their status quo. The whole novel, um, say it's a quieter one and they have to confront those abandonment issues. Um, you're gonna be seeding that emotional wound kind of throughout the, the story. Um, you don't have to be super heavy handed about it in the synopsis because it's gonna be clear from context from the plot points that you choose to include, which can be a really great way to kind of focus what you're including. Um, so this character has an abandonment wound. Um, you're including plot points then that show this poor character having to face that particular emotional wound. Um, it comes to a big climax where he uh, has to decide to do something scary, something that will make him confront the emotional wound, and then we have the resolution about what happens after after he does it. Um, so character and plot, just like with drafting, um, really work very closely together, and it can help really focus your synopsis on what to include um, to make sure that the plot points you are including support your character's arc. Um, Lauren? <laughs> Um, oh, this is this is really hard because I don't know if I really have very specific advice besides just like put it in. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how helpful that is. Um, I think you know, I feel like for a synopsis, the plot is obviously the easiest thing to do, right? You're going out, they're going to the all the characters are here, they're going here, there's a fight scene or a, a battle or a meet cute or however you're going to put it in. Um, those are some of the, the easiest things that I think I think it was Hannah Cates that was saying it earlier with establishing sort of the the motives early on for some of the characters in relation to the plot. And I think you want to want to look at that, um, which could be a little bit more internal, which goes totally against what my earlier point was for the previous question. Um, but some of those spots, right, where it's balancing what is happening internally for the character along with the plot, right, they should be sort of complementary, or they should go totally against each other, right? Something's happening in the character's mind is somewhere else, or, or thinking about choices in the past, or things that could happen, and, and it's pretty easy to weave it in there. Um, you know, you want to strike that balance between what's happening for the characters, and also, you know, what's, what's happening in the actual story, right, the setting and the plot, and moving towards the, the resolutions. Um, but that's a, that's a lot, but the synopses are sort of braided. There's a lot going on that you want to throw in there to let the reader know what's happening. So um, just, <laughs> what I had to keep, keep saying is like, just do it, just, just put it in there. It's, it's exactly what it is. It's sort of what the synopsis ends up being. And I feel like that's not very helpful, but from an editor point of view, it's like, just put it on the page and then go from there and then see where you get. And how much it's? I feel like, yeah. Oh my goodness. There's so much. I, I literally had an author like flip me off both hands, the most loving way the other day. Like it had totally like completely in love, but I, yeah, when you say like, oh, just whatever you do, just do it right. It's it's hard, but you do have to, That that's the thing we got to talk about too. Just get it on the paper. It's not going to be perfect. You're going to rewrite it 17 million times. That's okay. That's part of the process. That's what it means to be human. Um, but how do you incorporate character arc into the synopsis. So this is something that I actually really struggled with with my last submission. Um, and I really got help with uh, from my agent and another editor actually. Um, so your character has a problem, right? They have a flaw, they have an obstacle, they have something that they need to overcome that they haven't been able to do yet and of course there's the out the help from without right whether that's the mentor or the magic sword or going to paris to meet the love of their life or whatever else they're going after but there's also something inside of them right so you say oh my character has to go to paris to meet the love of his life i'm gonna ask okay so why hasn't he done it already 
why is now the time? Why is now why your character needs to change? And so when you say, oh, my character gets sad and runs away. Okay, why? My character gets mad because and does this. Okay, well, why? And we don't need this big stream of consciousness. You don't have to psych psychoanalyze and like get your character on Freud's couch for your synopsis. But I do need to understand what's motivating your character and why they're making their decisions. Because like I said, um, nothing exists in a vacuum. Your character has a constant feedback loop of emotion. And as they're going through and making these decisions and also suffering the consequences, their worldview is going to change for better and for worse. So I don't need a whole separate section psychoanalyzing your character. What I wanna understand is how their internal changes are impacting the external world and why uh, those internal changes are equipping them to do the thing that they haven't been able to do up to now. Okay. Yeah. So I think this is easiest if, um, if first of all, you have a really good grasp of what your character arc is. Um, don't ask how I know that. Uh, and also if your character arc, like the more closely bound it is to the plot, the easier it is. Um, like I struggled with this a little bit with my debut, partially because the main character, like she kind of has a character arc, but um, she sort of has a flat arc. She's not that different at the end of the story than she is at the beginning. She's working on it, um, but it's not like a really strong character arc. Um, Whereas in the manuscript that I'm revising now with my agent, it, there is a very strong, very clear character arc that is absolutely inseparable from the plot. And so that made it really easy because every plot point essentially was also a big character arc moment. Um, but it also helps like practical things you can do is just to sort of focus on not only what is happening plot wise and physically and whatever, but also um, making mention of like your character's emotional reaction to that or, or um, especially if that emotional reaction drives their next decision that propels the plot forward. So that way you're kind of closely tying together plot and character arc, you're showing how they relate to each other. And then also because they're kept so close together, it makes it easier to keep the synopsis shorter because you don't have to go off and be like, oh, by the way, here's this character arc stuff that's happening while this plot stuff is happening because it's all just happening at once. Next question, uh, do you have any techniques uh, to narrow down uh, our last story into a synopsis, uh, starting with Lauren? I feel, like I, I feel like I touched on this earlier, maybe I jumped, I jumped the gun with it a little bit, but I would really say to try, try to utilize the chapter outlines method. I think that that is, that is one of the easiest ways to do it because you're able to sort of look at it chapter by chapter, right? Every chapter is going to have its own little, little arc, right? Every chapter should have something to the story, whether it's for the character, whether it's for the character arcs or whether it's for the plot or whether it's for some of like the larger themes, like every character for every chapter will have some sort of beginning end right before you move on to the next chapter um and so in that way i would really boil it down and that'll make it easier especially if you know i've seen i see a lot of manuscripts coming my way that are like epic fantasies right like a like 130 plus um a thousand words and it's hard to, to just i mean it, it maybe it's a little bit easier if you have a nice like 65 70 000 word romance right like that's a, that's a lot easier to distill down rather than a huge epic fantasy with a lot of world building and lots of proper nouns being thrown at you um, i definitely would say they're different beasts but you really can use that same method for no matter what sort of novel it is right genre and age group um you're going to be able to track those those um chapter arcs and then really like write, write them into a list, write them chronologically. And then it's right, you already even are right there already pretty much have how your synopsis is going to be arranged and you can just build out or write around it. Hannah my kids? The problem is this group is too good. This group is too good. They're hitting all the things and I'm running out of things to say. So I'm gonna give a really bad piece of advice. Um, 
thankfully, I mean, I love working in middle grade and narrative nonfiction because we don't get this problem too often. I'm usually working between 35 and 80,000 words. So uh, sorry, all you epic fantasy writers, that's horrible <laughs> for you. Um, my recommendation, and it's actually gotten Bear with me on this because I've actually gotten a lot out of it. Um, besides what has all been covered, which is fantastic, um, little piece of advice, I guess a pro tip. Surprisingly, Wikipedia articles are fantastic. If you are looking at how to condense like a uh, song of ice and fire or another with multiple POVs and things going on, I really advise going onto Wikipedia and looking and seeing the plot summary on that article. Um, not all of them are great, so please don't hold my feet to the fire with this. But for the most part, books, movies, um, they're pretty snappy and they're pretty good. And you can see too, uh, with some of the books that you've read, hey, what were, uh, what are some things maybe that the author of the synopsis left out? And why did they leave it out? Does this make sense if they left it out? And if I don't agree with why they included it or left it out, you know, what, um, what were the consequences of that? So going on, uh, looking at those more epic stories and seeing how other authors have skillfully parsed them down is extremely helpful. It's helped me a lot. Thank you. Hamavi? So as a literary agent, I feel like I could be cheeky here and just say, make my clients do it themselves. Um, but but that is, uh, again, just me being silly. Um, I think, you know, like we've talked a little bit about a, a beat sheet or an outline can be really helpful. And then I've also found it very helpful to, again, just overwrite it, write every single thing. Uh, and then pare it down um, from there. I think it's always easier to cut than it is, than it is uh, to put things on, on the page. Um, so write it as long as you need it to be, cut, cut, cut. Um, and then, and then um, yeah, hopefully a synopsis can, can kind of emerge from, from there. Yeah. So aside from things that I have already repeated over and over again, like just not being due to, too detailed, um, which side note on that, point that if you have friends who have not read the actual manuscript, they are great people to read your synopsis because if you don't have enough information in there, if you've cut too much and now things are confusing, they'll be able to tell you that because they don't know what happens. Um, so make use of friends who have not read the story to read your synopsis. Um, but in addition to those things, honestly, line edits, like same thing that you would do to a manuscript am I just being too wordy here? You can cut a ridiculous number of words just by doing that kind of line edits. Um, because the synopsis is a shorter document, it's not going to necessarily be as drastic of a change as it would be with the actual manuscript, but you can definitely still get your word count down that way. Okay. So we talked about the, the opportunities to narrow down the story to the essential, but how do you, um, I will, uh, how do you avoid making your synopsis uh, look like a checklist of events? <laughs> and something with EM? The big thing I think is just not to be like, this happened, then this happened, then this happened. Like, don't just be telling us chronologically what happens, but actually like cause and effect. Like this happened and then the character reacted to it this way, which caused this next thing to happen. Um, and also going back to what I said when we talked about tying character arcs um, into your synopsis, if you can get a bit of the character's kind of mental state or motivations in there, um, I think that helps as well because now we're not just getting events, but we're also getting cause and effect. We're getting a little perspective on what this means to the character. Um, and so I think that really helps keep it from feeling like a checklist. Hamadi? I think it can also be helpful to avoid editorializing your synopsis. Um, so what I mean by that is um, you don't have to say, and in a flashback, this happened. The story opens with this character. Um, just narrate your story um, on a technical level, vary your sentence structure, just because, you know, it it is kind of a dressed up uh, checklist of events. That's what the synopsis actually is. Um, you can still try to, again, use good craft, um, vary sentence links, um, I think EM, uh, EM had some great points about um, tying in character reactions too, which again can 
can help um, make your prose sing a little more. Uh, so if we're thinking of that, um, our that character I mentioned earlier with the abandonment wound. Um, so something happens to to that character, and then you might write um, feeling abandoned. The character then did something that he would that he was about to regret. Um, so just mixing it up that way um, can I think uh, breathe a little bit of life into a synopsis. Come back, Kate. Um, I mean, other Hannah, well, I'm the other Hannah, Hannah V and Ian hit on it perfectly. Cause and effect. What is the difference between a grocery list and a recipe? A grocery list is just a list of foods. A recipe shows you how those foods combine in a certain order to create something very specific. So, and I know Lauren talked about this too, like the, the transitions. Taking these disparate elements and uh, showing how one leads to the other. So this happens, so then, and then that happens. So that uh, I wanna see how the dominoes are lined up and how they fall. Because if this is happening over the here and that's making that happen over here, which sets the stage for this, um, you're right, your writing in the synopsis absolutely should not be violet. This is not to, place to showcase how great of a writer you are. Uh, as Lauren said, there are other places in your uh, submission package to do that. Um, but you can organically show me that by one act begetting the other, by one decision knocking down a domino that then leads to the next, that there's organic tension, that there's that third rail that's going to drive your story. Um, Lauren. Yeah, I feel like everybody is just answers knocked out of the park. I don't, I don't really know if there's really much, much to add. I think everybody's kind of covered like transitions and, and adding. Um, I think establishing the stakes right from the beginning and making sure that all those stakes are answered at the end, right? You don't want to get to the end of the synopsis and like get that light feeling of like, wait, what happened to X element. Like I've had that happen every once in a while on this mission. And it's like amazing and mind blowing. And then you'll get to the end and you're like, wait, what happened to that one character or this something? So that's one thing to, to make sure is just to go back and write your you have your checklist, but make sure that you follow follow them up at the end. That would be one thing as you're going back through and rereading your synopsis. You want to make sure that you've sort of like tied up those those neat little endings like um as, as you're going through. Um in terms of sort of like making it like a checklist, I think some people have come up with like some 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 good metaphors there. Um, in terms of of stringing things along, like as people were talking, I was thinking of like jewelry, right? Like you want to make sure that like you, you know the necklace looks pretty, but there's other elements beyond just like the main jewels. You want to make sure that it's not all the same. Um, and so in that way, just making sure to sort of pad that. Um, I think Hannah Kate said something about the the per violet pros, not purple pros, which I think is important. Um, but I would say you know if you want to have that last line zinger you can go for it but I don't think I would as I said before like make sure that your synopsis is not the, the place where you are putting in those stunning poetic lines I'm sure in your actual novel right we want the beats there but if you want to end on on that that thing that'll stick in the the uh, editor's mind as, as you're looking through or agent if you're at the querying stage that's definitely something that I would say you can hone in on but concentrate on the arcs more than more than your prose concentrate on on those very specific moments that you're going to be hitting as opposed to just, just the pros and the transition. Okay, and last question for this panel. What are common pitfalls or mistakes made with a synopsis? Am I Kate? Oh, I should have such an easy answer because I've done all of them. I'm so guilty, I've done them all. Um, I know we've talked about it and I'm gonna just push it forward again. Um, beware of the gimmick. Beware of mistaking, um, mistaking a plot weakness with, uh, or, or trying to band-aid it with violent pro, oh, violent, sorry, not violent. Don't do it with violent either. Don't do it with violent, don't do it with violent. Um, but we wear of band-aiding a structural problem with uh, with line by line prose. So some people, uh, I get a lot of authors come to me. They're like, "Oh my gosh! Well, when I read my synopsis, like it just sounds so boring." 
And that's a really good question to ask. Like if this list of your whole story and the arc sounds boring, then okay, what's the problem? If there's no tension in your synopsis, that might be an indication of a big problem that there's a lack of tension in your story. If uh, you're getting confused by your synopsis because there's, uh, as Lauren mentioned, uh, there are threads that aren't tied up or there's a lack of um, a lack of resolution somewhere, beware because your synopsis is mirroring your story. And if there are holes to be plugged within the synopsis, uh, instead of trying to uh, to plug them with that violet language, with being trying to be clever or trying to use a gimmick to attract attention, um, looking back at your story and seeing if there's, you know, is there a bigger problem here because of course writing synopsis um, is extremely difficult. It can be grueling but it can also be a very helpful um, 30,000 foot view of your road trip to see if you're doubling back to see if the choices uh, the choices that you make maybe aren't in the uh, the most efficient way or if you're taking detours that you don't need to take like look at it as, Look at it as a roadmap, back up, and then see if you're actually on the path that you wanted originally for your story. Don't just try to band-aid it. Really look and see if there is a problem. Thank you. Um, Lauren? Yeah, so I, I, have, I have a pretty simple one, which I see all the time, which is keep reading to find out. or open the full novel to, to see. And I would say that if you are writing a synopsis, it's not a book summary. It is not the blurb that's going to go in the, in the, you know, on the inside cover, right? You want to know every single plot. So some of the time I will be reading something and I'll get there. And then it's like, and then we don't really know what happens. No, 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 no. <laughs> the synopsis should have all beats. So that should include the endings and the twists and the reveals and the deaths and the mistaken identities and the mysterious disappearances, all of the nitty gritties for your whole arc. So that would be my, my main pitfall and mistake. And you'd be surprised how many people will not include all beats. And that's something that an agent, an editor, whoever is going to be assessing your synopsis will be looking for. Because if we don't know the answer, the, we may not necessarily always have the ability to read the entirety of the book to, to figure out the end goals. We want the synopsis, this is just my little two cents as an acquisition editor. The synopsis should give us the whole picture for your novel. We should be able to figure out the beats, which will help figure out right, like how much developmental work is going to be going into this novel. And that could be make or break for uh, a publisher or an editor or an agent picking up this book. Because, you know, we're all busy industry people, all busy. We've all got a lot of different projects going on. So if there's something that is a great story, but we maybe don't know that last plot twist and we may need to completely revise the last third of the, the novel, that may be a make or break decision. So um, that would be a major pitfall. Include all arcs, include all beats, and don't hedge around revealing anything. We want to know. Thank you. Ian? OK, so I definitely sound like a broken record now, but too much detail. I think um, almost any time that I have done a synopsis critique for someone, that is like my main feedback. It's I'm like, OK. You are telling me way too much here. I don't need to know all of this to understand the main plot. You need to cut it back. Um, so I think that is a major one. And then um, referring back to the last, the previous question, just the, um, sometimes they do tend to just read like a checklist. And so working on that um, and trying to vary the flow of sentences as has been said and get those character reactions to plot events in there and things like that. Um, so that would be the other one, is is them reading just like a checklist of events. Okay, and Hanavi. These are such great tips um, on how to write a synopsis. Uh, I think, you know, from a writer's mindset, too, is don't be intimidated by your story. I think that's something that is very common, uh, where a writer is like, oh, my goodness, I need to boil down my 120,000 word sleeping masterpiece of a fantasy into 500 words, and that can feel really intimidating. Um, so don't don't be, try not to be intimidated by that. Um, you know, use some of the tips that, that we were talking about 
here um, that can boil your story down to to that core, to that um, very foundation of what it is and then add plot points as you need. I find it really helpful to lead with character to do that. Who is your character at the beginning of the story? Who are they at the end? And what are the steps necessary to get them there? Um, and kind of um, doing your synopsis that way. Other writers have have talked about, you know, they use the synopsis very early on and strip things away um, to, to boil your story down to that core. I don't really think that there is a right way to approach a synopsis or a wrong way to approach it. Um, it's just the, the most important to, to understand that it's just one part of a submission package, whether it's uh, to agents or publishers. Um, don't put too much pressure on yourself that it's that it's paralyzing. Uh, and remember that um, your story, uh, your pages are always going to be the most important. Um, a synopsis is there simply to support that. So trust in the strength of your story. Okay, so before we wrap up, I will let uh, each panelist um, remember to either give a last bit of advice or to plug anything they want to plug. Starting with uh, Hanavi. Um, so the only thing that I have to plug uh, is feel free to query me. I am open to queries right now. Uh, if you feel like your synopsis is polished, uh, you can feel free to submit me a query. I do ask for a synopsis as well, uh, as well as pages. Uh, you can find me on Query Manager and I would love to check out your work. Thank you. Ian? Um, okay, well, I have a debut novel to plug, so I'm going to plug that. Uh, it's called The Remarkable Retirement of Edna Fisher. It's an adult contemporary fantasy novel starring an 83-year-old who leaves the nursing home when she learns she's the chosen one, um, and things get more complicated from there. Found family, dragons, um, queer characters, probably some neurodiverg neurodivergent characters, um, because that just happens, because that is me. Um, it's fun, it's a little angsty, there's kind of an adventure, it's in a contemporary setting, but magic exists and everyone knows about it. Um, there's also an audiobook, so check that out, and my links are on my link tree. Um, the URL is Eliz M. Anderson, which is also my handle on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Lauren? Yeah, so um, pretty much all of my information can be found on my website at laurentdavila.com. I have a fully extensive list of sort of anything I'm looking for in terms of acquiring at Inked and Gray Press. Um, I have my full manuscript wish list up there along with all of our submission details. We are currently closed for uh, general submissions, but I'm always pretty active during pitch contests and such. So if I do end up fitting anything that you're currently writing, uh, keep an eye out for me during those events. Um, other than that, in terms of my own work as an anthologist, I have a few releases that are out and you can find that as well on my website. Um, I have a few genre works as I sort of plugged it right at the beginning, um, as well as um, a few others that have been published over the last few months. So um, anything you'd want to pick up would be on my website. And Hannah Keats. Okay, uh, my last piece of advice, um, please be kind to yourself. Be kind to yourself. Um, your first draft is not going to be perfect. This is, uh, this is a journey, it's not a destination. I have been doing this for years and I have yet to write a perfect synopsis. Um, I'll, I'll let you know when I do, but I'm not there yet. Um, so please just be kind, be patient with yourself. Um, like Lauren, you can find me on my website, authorhannahkates.com. I am open uh, to submission package, uh, package scrubs right now. So if you guys are looking for help for your, uh, uh, for your synopsis, for your submission package, I'd be happy to do so. Um, I also am a re resident editor editor here at Right Hive. So go to the Ask the Editor section, hit me up, tag me in one of your comments. I'm happy to chat about this, about Dungeons and Dragons, about anything else. Uh, just, uh, yeah, you can find me on the server. All right, so thank you to all of our panelists. And uh, thank you all uh, for watching this video. If you are watching live, the panelists will be in the chat to answer any other question. And yeah, uh, happy rest of Raha and happy rest of your day.